Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. I'm still on break while I'm gearing up for our seventh season of the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. I'll be back in a few weeks with a new format, a few major announcements, and another all-star lineup of guests. In the meantime, I've selected a handful of our most popular episodes from 2023, and whether or not you're listening to this episode for the first time or listening again, Zach Mercurio was so good, we invited him back for the second conversation in early 2023. It won't take but a few seconds to understand why. Let's get started. Maslow's Pyramid is a trap. And what I mean by that is it's a trap because it's very easy to say, oh, we just got to give people their basic needs of food, the, the basic needs of, of shelter. We, we're just giving them a job, so we're fulfilling their basic needs. And they don't need any of the other stuff yet. And I, I see that all the time, Maslow being used as an excuse actually not to actualize other people. And here's the big problem with Maslow is there's really no such thing as self-actualization. Uh, if you look at Maslow's pyramid, you start with the food, shelter, um, safety. All of those things rely on who? They rely on other people to provide systems that feed us, that shelter us, right? Then you go one level up, love, belonging. Where do, we, where do we get belonging from? We don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and cultivate our own belonging and love. We rely on others for love. And then you get up to esteem building. Again, that's the confidence in our own worth. Well, to understand and know our confidence and know the confidence in our worth, we have to have evidence in our environment that we're worthy. And then finally, you get up to fulfillment and contribution, right? The path to self-actualization actually runs through others. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy, never-normal shift going on all around us. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of people, business, and technology. Here is your host, Ira Wolf. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. Hey, and I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today around the future of work. And our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow as we explore the convergence of business, technology, and people. On today's episode, we're going to delve into a critical issue affecting the modern workplace, the epidemic of loneliness. Now, before you swipe left and wonder what the heck this has to do with the future of work, you might want to keep listening because loneliness isn't a condition just affecting the retired, seniors, the disabled, and bored children. It's having a devastating impact on employee engagement, employee well-being, which then puts an enormous strain on business productivity and growth. So you might be thinking that if, when we're talking about loneliness, that this is a really good reason to bring, to mandate workers back to the office, but not so fast. Because a recent study by EY revealed that 82% of respondents indicated they have felt lonely at work. That's because an employee does not have to be alone to feel lonely. Lonely employees can be lonely even when interacting frequently with others if those lonely employees don't feel like they matter. And it's not just their well-being and mental health that's at stake, but studies have shown that the impact of loneliness has the same physical impact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and, that's, and it's even worse for diabetes. So the cost of healthcare absenteeism, presenteeism due to loneliness and a lack of mattering is in the billions of dollars every year. So we believe this issue is so critical that we invited back a guest who was just on a few weeks ago, Zach Mercurio, who's devoted his life to really teaching us about mattering at work. So we're going to continue this conversation today. But before we do that, we're going to talk about our perfect labor storm segment. So in each episode, we focus on a disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know about. 
And here is today's perfect labor store. According to some just released data from the Society for Human Resource Management, one in three U.S. employees say their job had a negative effect on their mental health over the last six months. That same report found that nearly half of U.S. employees, 45 percent, have higher expectations for the level of mental health support their organizations provide. That's compared to just a year ago in 2022. So what are employees looking for from their employers when it comes to mental health in the workplace? Could it be something being made to feel like it matters? Just keep listening because you're not going you're going to want to hear what Zach has to say about mattering at work. Yeah, Ira, I mean, we couldn't have picked a better month for Zach to come back with us. May, as many of our listeners know, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so it's really critical that we we address these things. And I've got to tell you, just in the spirit of keeping it real with mental health, Ira, it's been a rough few weeks for my family. And I know it's been the same for you too. We've lost some loved ones. You and I have recently, we've, we've had some hospitalizations, we've had family emergencies and even a blown engine on a van, <laughs> just to name a few. And you know, there, there was something that really caught my eye this week from one of our good friends, Andrea Butcher, who's the CEO of HRD consulting firm and one of our um, fellow partners in People Forward Network, she had a really insightful post on LinkedIn that, that I think really ties in with what Zach is going to chat with us about today. And it caught my because it was, was talking about her posted about having those not, quote unquote, not good enough moments. And we've all experienced them, you know, those moments when we feel like we aren't good enough. And for many of us, myself included, it's often tempting to keep those thoughts to yourself because we fear or we worry about feeling ashamed or that it'll negatively affect how other people look at us. But the funny thing is that the opposite is actually true. If we can't share those moments with others, that probably says more about ourselves than it does about the other person. In other words, creating this feeling that we matter, it's, it's not really an individual endeavor. It requires others. It requires community as part of the story. And I'm fortunate enough that I'm surrounded by a lot of loved ones, a lot of friends like you and workplace colleagues who really do care and, and show me that they care and that I matter, including my mental health and including the days when a lot of things just aren't adding up or making sense. But a lot of other people, they aren't as fortunate as I am. But with leaders and researchers like Zach, who are stepping into this work of showing us how to create cultures of mattering in the workplace, there's so much reason for hope and optimism that the future of mental health and work is heading in the right direction so that work truly does become a community and a place where we can speak into those moments and help nurture and develop people in even stronger ways. So having said all that, let's welcome back today's guest for an encore performance, Zach Mercurio. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Ira. That's a that was a powerful opening. Just a lot of stuff going on in people's lives, and and we're glad that we have a space today that we can talk about those things, and you can speak some wisdom into those with us. And the last time we were chatting with you, you mentioned that you're working on a new book, so maybe that's a good place for us to start off with. Is tell us what you're working on right now when it comes to mattering in the workplace, and a little bit about the book, and then we'll start diving into some of those specifics in more detail. Yeah. So when you look at what's going on right now, this empathy deficit that we're seeing amongst leaders for their followers, the feelings of invisibility in organizations, the feelings of being undervalued, underrecognized, these things are coming up in report after report after report. But why aren't we taking action toward addressing them? Right. And some of us are. But if you look at Gallup's engagement curve, it's been flat since they they started publishing engagement data. I mean, I could just say engagement will be 13% every year for the next 10 years. And I'll probably be right. 13% of the world's engaged in their work. And so what I'm working on is trying to understand 
what gets in the way of leaders caring? What gets in the way of us caring for one another? And how can we learn the hard skills to care? We have processes and procedures and practices for everything else in organizations, but what genuinely matters to human beings. And so my goal with this book, it's going to be called, uh, well, I haven't even said this publicly yet, but it's going to be called Mattering Comes First, is really trying to turn this common sense idea of being a good human into a set of skills and practices that can be scaled to ensure that everybody around us feels noticed and firmed and needed regularly. So this is a it's a it's a skill book that's based on the research of what creates the experience of feeling significant for other people. Well, and we appreciate you name dropping the title for the book first ever time. It's, prelim- out in the public it's preliminary. Domain. So like if you have feedback, just send me an email. I <laughs> love it. Love it. And obviously just let us know if we need to, you know, you know, kind of blurt that out, you know, no, you don't, if, if your editor wants to sue, but we appreciate you sharing that. And obviously really important work too. And there've been some really interesting things coming out, obviously with the proliferation of AI, we were talking about this before we mm. went on the air of, you know, it, it's pretty telling when we're getting a lot of patients in hospitals in particular that are rating the empathy that they get from a chat bot is actually preferable to the Mm -hmm. bedside manner that they might get sometimes from certain healthcare professionals, maybe doctors in particular. And it just goes to show that really is a skill deficit. Like you said, these processes and strategies that we have in place that we have for every other part of the business, we can't just assume these are things people should know. They should know how to Mm -hmm. empathize. They should know how to communicate with care for other people and show others that matter. Mm. And we've taken that for granted for too long. And so from your perspective, where do we begin? at Mm. developing the right processes, the right strategies to start creating an environment where number one, you acknowledge, okay, this is a skill set. It's not just stuff that happens naturally for people, but then number two, how do you develop and nurture that over time? Yeah. I mean, first we have to believe that we matter to other people. This is a massive deficit. There's research out there that says low self-esteem amongst leaders is actually a key predictor of whether they'll create a toxic work environment. Low self-esteem amongst leaders. There's research that finds that 85% of the world's population has low self-esteem. Self-esteem is the confidence in one's worth. Now, many leaders actually have high self-efficacy. So there's a difference. Self-efficacy is the belief in my capabilities to do something. But the problem with when a leader has low, lower self-esteem is that they have lower awareness of their potential impact on other people and are thus less likely to take responsibility for that impact and say things like, oh, this is just a job, or this person's here just for a paycheck, or they need to just work and and go home. And what happens is, is I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and is like, hey, I'm going to be an uncaring leader today. I think that what happens is that people forget their own significance as a leader, and that they have a massive impact on people's well-being. The reason why I say that there's a gap is because employees in recent surveys, just 24% of employees from worldwide samples indicate they think their manager or their leader cares about their well-being. So I think that one of the first things we need to do is we need to make sure that we're showing people that they have an inevitable impact, that leaders have a clear impact on people's lives, that if you are responsible for other people, you're responsible for where a human being with people who love them spend upwards of 35% of their waking life. So if we can like put that as the baseline duty of a leader at the forefront I think that will help people to see their impact. But I would say the other thing is that there's a big difference between caring about people and caring for people. You may care about people and caring about something means that you think something is important. You have affection for it. And that's great. That's a baseline requirement, a minimum qualification for leadership. But there's a difference between caring about something and caring for something. So caring for someone means that you have to get up close. You have to deeply understand 
the person or whatever it is that you're caring for. And caring for is a set of skills. So I think often we say like, oh, I'm a leader. I care about my people or my people are my greatest asset. But we got to get into the mindset of do I have the interpersonal skill set to care for people repeatedly and to create repeated experiences where people do feel cared for. So I think those two lenses and changing how we approach what we do, especially in the leadership realm, are essential. Zach, there's so many tracks I can go through, you know, with that. I, I got like a million notes. Remember to talk about that. That we'll be here for another two, three hours. But in the in the sake of time, you introduced, I think it was in a conversation after the last session when we just met off offline about Maslow. Mm. And you brought up self-esteem, which mm -hmm. is near the top of the the hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, of his uh, hierarchy of needs. But I, I don't think there's, I, I would say that in the last, you know, in my business career of 40 years, but in the last 25, 20, 25 years, I don't think there's any presentation that ever goes by at a conference that somebody doesn't talk about this hierarchy and needs of mm -hmm. self-actualization. That's, that's our goal. But you revealed something that uh, Maslow recognized about 20 years, maybe 30 years after he he revealed that. So yeah, you want to share yeah, that yeah. because I think that that mm -hmm. fits perfectly into the self-esteem question. And yes. then that leads into something else we were talking about. One of our other favorite people was Marty Seligman, which is uh -huh. the title of our of, of the show, by the way, which was Maslow, Marty <laughs> and, and Mattering. Yeah, um, I want you to bring that in. <laughs> you know, so it, it fits so well within that. Yeah. But let's talk about Maslow, because I, I think this is a myth that gets perpetuated. Uh -huh. And I can see why people would have low self-esteem because so few of us can reach that level. Maslow's pyramid is a trap. And what I mean by that is it's a trap because it's very easy to say, oh, we just got to give people their basic needs of food, the, the basic needs of, of shelter. We, we're just giving them a job. So we're fulfilling their basic needs and they don't need any of the other stuff yet. And I, I see that all the time, Maslow being used as an excuse actually not to actualize other people. And here's the big problem with Maslow is there's really no such thing as self-actualization. If you look at Maslow's pyramid, you start with the food, shelter, safety. All of those things rely on who? They rely on other people to provide systems that feed us that shelter us, right? And then you go one level up, love, belonging. Where do, we, where do we get belonging from? We don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and cultivate our own belonging and love. We rely on others for love. And then you get up to esteem building. Again, that's the confidence in our own worth. Well, to understand and know our confidence and know the confidence in our worth, we have to have evidence in our environment that we are worthy. And then finally, you get up to fulfillment and contribution, right? The path to self-actualization actually runs through others all the way up the pyramid. There is no self-actualization. There's, we actualize one another. And, you know, Maslow actually spent uh, the summer of 1938 in, with the Blackfoot people, Native American people. And he was astounded when he observed that upwards of 80 to 90% of this Blackfoot tribe had a quality of self-esteem that he could only see in like 5 to 10% of the general population. And he was obsessed with figuring out why. And some of the Blackfoot members described self-actualization much differently than Maslow did. They said that we believe that human beings are born actualized already. And it's the requirement of each other to bring out and nurture the love, belonging, the esteem that allows people to contribute and self-actualize. Actualize. In, in the Blackfoot culture, it's been termed community actualization. And this realization was powerful. I mean, Maslow, years later, said that you, that, that actually he got it wrong in a paper. He said that we actualize each other. The path to self-actualization actually goes through others. But in the West, we overlook that. And this is the last barrier to what I think is contributing to our lack of care of one another. 
is that we think well-being is an individual responsibility. And if I have one critique of the well-being research, even the psychological well-being research of which I'm a part of, it's that it over-indexes the individual and under-recognized the importance of each other for creating well-being for, for others. The self-help approach to well-being isn't working, right? Between 2015 and 2020, if I were to show you a graph of self-help books published, and then I would show you a graph of incidents of depression, you would see it going up together like this. Those are just two data points. They, they don't relate. I'm not saying they correlate or cause one another, but I'm just saying our self-help approach to well-being isn't working. Well-being, as you said, is a community endeavor. And so we have to believe that we are responsible for each other's well-being. And I think that's a key prerequisite to addressing some of the issues that we see. And I think we need to start teaching this in kindergarten. I love that, Zach. And the, one of the questions that comes to mind for me is, do we have a lot of people that maybe, if you were to ask them to describe, what does mattering in the workplace feel like to you? How many people could actually describe that and say, oh, yeah, let me tell you about this experience or these experiences that I had mm. that truly made me feel like I mattered. And here were the people and here are the things that they did or the mm. things that they said that made me matter. So there's something yeah. around that. And then I'd, I'd love to hear from you on a personal level. How have you experienced that before? What does mattering in the workplace feel like to Zach Mercurio? Mm. Well, so first, I think that if you ask people what, think about a moment in your life when you've most believed that you mattered because of someone else, that's a powerful place to start. When we're doing a research study right now where we're, we're asking people about how, when, and where they come to experience significance, and many times it's these earliest moments. I remember a woman in a research study who said that she's a high powered executive now, but she said that. The moment in her life that keeps her going, and she reminds herself regularly, is when her mom, she was the daughter of a single mother, and her mom was setting up the Christmas tree and brought out the ladder. And when she was six years old, finally said, hey, you go put the star up on the top. And she, those moments, right, of feeling like we're significant, like we're capable very early on tend to influence how we think about ourselves. So if there's parents listening or, or sports coaches listening or teachers listening, I mean, that is incredibly important. Those early moments are critical to experiences of mattering. But then we often find that actually when we ask people about moments that they don't feel like they matter, they're almost all work-related. So how powerful is this though? It means that experiences of anti-mattering are just as powerful as experiences of mattering. And a lot of times they come from the workplace. So it even gives us more of an opportunity to learn from the lessons in our own life about the people in our lives that help us feel like we matter, whether it's our grandmothers, parents, caretakers, coaches, those people that have come into our lives. And then think, how can I replicate what I felt in those moments with the people I lead? And it's a powerful practice to really think about that. For me personally, when I feel like I matter is when I'm able to see the invisible upstream impact of my work. There's a great quote, I forget who it's by. It says, a river's source knows nothing of where it ends. And that's the truth with most of our lives, right? We have to imagine our impact. But the only way to imagine our inevitable impact is to get evidence of our impact back from the front, back from the river's end, right? And when people take the time to do that, and it doesn't happen often in my work, believe it or not, it, it, it's powerful. You know, I've had people say to me that because I asked them that question of when they felt like they mattered, even though they were in a group of people and they didn't have an answer, they realized through listening to other people because the other people started telling stories about them and how they were significant and how they felt that for the first time in their life, they felt like they mattered. When people feed that back to me and I see the evidence of my significance, that's what keeps me going. Zach, it's so uncanny. Some of the references that you've, that you've shared and some of the analogies and some of the stories, because your river analogy or river quote is what Marty Seligman and Gabriella Kellerman talk about in their new book, Tomorrow Mind. Mm. And they, their analogy, their metaphor is the modern whitewater world of work. 
Mm, so think about the river, not only don't yeah, we know what, yeah, the, what yeah. the source in the end, but right. what the pathway is. But they and, and I want to see if these skills mirror what you're talking about with the skills that are required by leaders and by everyone mm. in the mm. workplace uh, for mattering at work. So they have they develop through their research what they call this the five key skills and the acronym is PRISM. Mm hmm. So the, the P is prospection, and that's uh, being able to anticipate the ability to anticipate the future, not to control it, not to manage it, but to, to, to be able to anticipate it. Resilience, which I don't think we need to go into a lot. Innovation, well, that's the I. So P is, is prospection. R is resilience. I is innovation. S is social support that mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. uh but but i thought they did it in a very unique way because they talk about rapid rapport in in our world that is fast moving and dynamic and we have these collaborative teams and project teams that we have to make connections quickly it's not mm -hmm. just having social skills interpersonal skills that could take years to develop right but it's right. having rapid the ability to have rapid rapport mm -hmm. and then the final one was mattering and mm -hmm. meaning Okay, mm -hmm. so there's two parts here, and one of them will probably continue after the break. But one was I wanted to know how similar some of those skills might be to what you were developing, or or at least comment on those. But the other part was they Marty Seligman made a significant revelation, just like Maslow, that their approach to finding meaning and meaningful mm -hmm. work was a bit naive and ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Because meaning to many of us is spiritual. And it's also ambiguous that for someone is, I can't find meaning at work because my, my meaning is God. Right. And, and how trivial that is for a manager to say, we're going to help you find, we're going to deliver meaningful work. Yet for other people, their career is their passion. It is their calling and what they deliver. So there, there was a huge differentiation of meaning and mattering. So let's start with the first comment. You have, yeah. you have skills that you identified. And then when we come back from the break, we'll pick up on that, the differences between purpose. Because I know in your Invisible Leader book, you talk about purpose uh -huh. a lot. So purpose, meaning, and mattering. Yeah, I'll, I'll make two comments before the break. One is, I think the model's great. It's really nothing new. It's essentially ancient wisdom. If you look at every model of well-being or what a good leader should do, I mean, those things are inherently right. there, right? I would, I would take the M out and put it before all the other ones. I would, I would make it a, a, the prerequisite for anything else. Again, innovation. You can't innovate an experiment. You can't share your voice if you don't believe your voice is significant first. You, uh, any of the other things, what was the P? What's the P? Prospection. It's the, the ability to anticipate the future. Yeah. Why would you anticipate the future if you don't believe the future matters or your life matters? What's the R? Our resilience. <laughs> resilience, right? You have to have to survive. You need a will to survive. So I would actually put the mattering first which is the whole premise of what I'm working on. Because in order to do any of those things, you have to have the belief that you're significant. I will say also on the M piece, and I wonder if Marty talks about this. I haven't read Tomorrow Mine. I'm familiar with Marty's work, but I'm wondering if he talks about the difference between the meaning of work and the meaning in work. So meaning of work to somebody is what work means in their life. This is where like if it's a God's calling or whatever it is, or it's for a paycheck, that's the meaning of work. But meaning in work is what per someone experiences when they're there. That is what's accessible in any job, regardless of someone's meaning of their life or of their work, is the meaning in their work. That is what I'm obsessively working on, is how do we cultivate the skills to optimize people's experiences of positive meaning in their work, whatever job that they're in, whether they're cleaning bathrooms or running a multinational company. Zach, you keep queuing me up. So, so I, so the the one driver that, and I've said this working on an on an adapt on the AQ model, the adaptability quotient model, when we looked at the skills that were required to just adapt. So it's a small subsection of this was growth mindset mm. that you can't anticipate the future, you can't have resilience, you can't innovate, you can't support, and you can't have mat, you can't have meaning or mattering 
if you don't have an open mindset. Because yeah, uh, it's a growth yeah, mindset. It's right. beyond open mindset, right. but a growth mindset because we're all going to trip. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to have new challenges. Things are going to mm. be are even as well as we are at being prepared. There are things that will happen that are going to you know set us back or challenge us. Right. And we're all going to fall into that imposter syndrome. Maybe I wasn't that good. And, you know, all the self-esteem drops in. All those things are going to talk about. So I would put somewhere we yeah, need to yeah, I like this. I like this. Which, I love which, this. which tees me up for our commercial. Right. So brand new commercials coming on along with your new title about our, our AQ Plus Mindset Program. And there's going to be a QR code that I'll put up in the upper right corner. I'll give everybody a kind of a heads up that I just created a growth mindset quiz. So to see where you fall on the spectrum, because we all are on the spectrum, it's not that you have a growth mindset and you've cured yourself from fixed mindset because we all fall into that at some point, but it's a quick quiz that you can take online and I'll put the QR, uh, the QR code up in the upper right. But we'll be right back. Great conversation with Zach Mercurio about mattering at work, talking about the myths of Abraham Maslow, the work of Marty Seligman, and of course, the work of Zach Mercurio. We'll be right back. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. And welcome back to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Was I right, Zach? Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. That was like I was I was uh, listening what, to the ad and I was like, yeah, that yes. Yeah. Let's what, do what, that. What, what a queue up! <laughs> and then I put the QR code in the upper right corner for anybody who's watching can download our new growth mindset quiz. It only takes about four or five minutes to complete it. A couple easy questions, and you'll find out where you find all, fall on the spectrum of fixed to growth mindset. Mm. So I don't even know where to pick this up after that, after that last part. But one of the other things that you you did talk about with meaning and mattering and purpose, which was what we want to go into, because you talked a lot about purpose, mm -hmm. where where this fits. Is it a spectrum or is, an ev is it an evolving lexicon of you know words that we have? But in the book, they didn't necessarily talk directly that I remember about meaning for work or, or meaning. I well, yeah, meaning, I, meaning of the meaning of work in someone's work, life and right. the meaning in work. Right. You know, but they talked about the difference of jobs uh, of people have when we talk about meaning is that some people, the meaning of work is why they work is j literally just to get a paycheck and they're okay with that. And we almost slight them, say, no, 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 you have to have a bigger calling. You have right, to have something right. bigger in life. There's right. something else you're attached to. And they go, no, I just want to get go fishing. Right. You know, I just want to well, provide so, for so, my kids. So, yeah. So that's the meaning of work, though, in someone's life. Like the meaning of a job is to get someone's paycheck. But, but for example, the meaning in the work is what they're experiencing when they're there. For example... If someone works for a paycheck and they are a truck driver, right? And yet while they're driving that load and making sure they're backing up, making sure they're driving safely, are they driving safely so they can get a paycheck at the end of driving safely? Or are they going above and beyond because of something else? It's usually something else, right? When, when someone's doing work, the paycheck doesn't just appear when you do something well, like, right? Like it's not just there. So that's the difference between the meaning of work, right? The meaning of work, for example, and I'm, I'm doing some work with a trucking company right now, which is why this is top of mind. Meaning of work for someone who is a truck driver may be to put food on their table. But the meaning in work is to make sure they're keeping everybody else safe around them. They're working efficiently. They're delivering a product that is essential for a customer and then a customer's user. Those are the things that 
you when you're a leader, you have to highlight and make sure that you're cultivating and spotlighting the meaning in work for people, regardless of why someone's there. And this is often a trap because leaders often tell me, oh, they're just there for a paycheck. They're not just there for a they're not just there for a paycheck. They're there to do work that is important and they're human beings who are spending time away from people who love them under your care. That is not, that's not just a paycheck. Uh, you are responsible for the, a huge percentage of a human being's life. So typically what happens is how we see people is how we treat them and how we treat them is who they become. So if we see someone as just there for a paycheck, we treat them as they're just there for a paycheck and that's what they become to us. And this is what I think has led to the dehumanization of the American worker. Jack, I don't want to, I, I think Jason has a, a question, but I, I don't want this to get lost because one of the biggest struggles that we talk about is like, especially even with the invisible leader. So this is for people that aspire to be leaders or people are actually in that position where you're talking about working with a trucking company. We're talking mm -hmm. about a traditional hardcore mm -hmm. blue collar, what was thought of as a blue collar job. Mm -hmm. You don't need a, a four-year college degree. You don't need an advanced education. Mm -hmm. You certainly need a specific skill set. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about mattering and purpose just being a senior level professional career uh, or, nope. or for, for seniors and professionals. We're talking about this for frontline hourly workers. Oh, yeah. I've... I've worked with cleaners, I've worked with plumbers, I've worked with janitors, I've worked with CEOs. I've never met a person in a job who didn't experience purpose in their job. And and what's ironic is we <laughs> said nothing is new. The book, it's probably 25 years old. I think it was Tom Peters and he interviewed somebody mm -hmm. from Southwest, a mechanic from, or a maintenance guy from Southwest. Mm -hmm. Lines. He, was, he was cleaning out the uh, hangar and he said, what do you do around here? And he says, I help our pilots and passengers fly safely. Mm -hmm. That's the and, reason. Yeah, right. Like that's the reason why the job exists. Right. Uh, and so we've been working on this for a long yeah, time. <laughs> yeah, we have, but yet it still like is not enacted and practiced. And we don't treat people as if they're in an essential job and they're doing things that are important, which is I think a, a chief role of a leader is to be an architect of meaning, right? To make sure that people can see the inherent meaning that's in the job that they're doing, regardless of the meaning of the work. And I think that that's a, this is a missing perspective to illuminate that. And like, so you mentioned the difference between purpose and meaningfulness and mattering. Purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. Every job has a purpose, right? Now, not every job is pleasurable, but that's not the same thing. What's pleasurable is not always purposeful. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, trust me. You know, <laughs> staying up late with someone who's sick is not pleasurable, but it is purposeful. He needs me, right? So I think we conflate that. We want all of our work to be pleasurable, but when we seek pleasure, we can often miss out on seeing the purpose. Meaningfulness is the experience of our work as positive and significant. Purpose is one input into that, but it's that experience that this work is significant. I feel I'm significant in my job. This job is significant. but Mattering is the experience of being significant to other people while I'm working. So there's a little, I know you teed that up before the break, but I wanted to break that down, purpose, meaningfulness, and mattering, what we mean by those things, because I think it's important. That's perfect, Zach. And the other thing that you brought in, you didn't use the term, but you brought in the Pygmalion effect um, yes, and, how, and right. how prevalent that is in the workplace. And for, for, for our listeners... That part, if you if you go back a few minutes ago when Zach was talking about if you as a leader, if you're treating your people like they just need to show up for a paycheck, uh -huh. the way that your people are going to show up and act is yes. to just show up for a paycheck. And that's what the Pygmalion effect is that Zach was referencing here is that most folks, there's going to be exceptions, but most folks are going to live up or down to the expectations of what they think is expected from them, from others. Yeah, no one rises. Like no matter. one rises to low expectations. I love that. That's perfect. You know, and there's absolutely. A, yeah, 
And, the, and, and that's and it's so prevalent in workplaces, but it, I think it's also so innocuous. And I think that's why it often doesn't get addressed, Zach, is that it's one of those things I think many leaders just assume people should just show up and understand how to do things and just get the job done without understanding mm-hmm. in order to do that well, there's a lot of stuff before then that needs to be in place to make people feel like they matter first, which is what you've been telling us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think, and I, I think I mentioned this in our last conversation. It's uh, and and Marty says this, writes this really well in in his article about his book. He says that thriving takes time, right? Well being takes time, and often we're so caught up in the short term, short termism of getting more performance and productivity. So we try to manipulate performance and productivity. But yet we don't do the long game work of cultivating an environment that regenerates the energy needed to produce for the short term, for the long term. And so what happens is, is that we end up doing these short term fixes and it's just like roller coaster well-being, right? We get people, we do these things, we get perks, people are all happy and they're motivated to the next quarter and then they get burned out. And then we do something else and then they get burned out. And I, I think that if you just look at the last 10, 15, 20 years, you could just track this roller coaster. Uh, well-being of trends in the workplace. Well, we're talking about burnout. Okay, now we're talking about yoga and meditation. Now we're talking about burnout again. Now we're talking about well-being and mental health in the work. Now we're talking right. But like I said, these you know these well-being programs that have been created are more like coping programs. They help employees cope with the stressors your system puts on them. Right. You need to do yoga. You need to do meditation instead of changing the system to enable the well-being you say you want, which is the and long Zach, game. And Zach, I got to ask you some questions too about the future of work, right? Mm. Because we're a future of work show. And so let's have a little fun with this. Before we went on air, you know, we're talking about AI and how it just feels like it's proliferated since November. You know, it's yeah. been around for a long time. A lot of people that have been working on it have known it's coming. But for most of us out in the market, it's like all of a sudden, whoa, it's here and it's changing and disrupting a lot of stuff. In your opinion, getting your crystal ball out, Do you think that AI is going to enable mattering in the workplace to improve? Mm. Crystal ball. No, I don't. I think that there are a few things that can replicate the neurochemical mirroring that happens when we're with another human being. So for example, there's phenomenon called emotional contagion. For example, if you were here starting to talk about purpose and you started to feel different and better because of it, because I'm seeing you, because I'm listening to you, there's something that happens in our brain that allows me to mirror that feeling for you with you. That's one of the powers of experiences of mattering with one another. We can actually, research finds that our our emotions actually sync up. Like for example, when I'm doing a workshop and I am around I, and I have a group of people and I say to them, tell a story of when's the last time in your work that you felt like you mattered. And there are three people that don't feel like they matter. But then the first two people go and they tell a story. Inevitably, invariably, what happens is all of a sudden, the three people who didn't experience mattering start saying, oh, I see that, I do experience that. And that is called that cognitive mirroring that happens when two human beings are in the same place. I do not think that AI will ever be able to replicate that neurochemical interaction. Love it. And and I don't, I really don't. When it comes to mattering at work and belonging, I think that what AI can do, and we can use AI to better understand people, to better understand the forces of people's lives. AI is really good at systematizing processes, human processes to understand what are the dynamics? What are the inputs? It can help us predict when someone's going to struggle in work. This is what I would love to see. I would love to see AI be able to give us real-time intelligent information about when someone is going to struggle, give us signals so we can predict burnout before it happens and we can start offering resources earlier. I think predictive AI in that realm will have a huge impact on helping us serve people better. But I don't think it can replicate the interpersonal interaction and what happens biologically, neurochemically, sociologically when human beings are together. Well, and you just answered the second question I had with that, which was, do you believe in the future when we're working with AI agents, are they going to seek connection 
in the mm-hmm. workplace as well, or seek mm-hmm. mattering as well. And mm-hmm. so you kind of answered that one where it's it's not going to be the same way that that you know we humans connect in those experiences. Well, is, let's is look, that accurate? Yeah, let's look how let's look at how AI learns, right? Through language modeling, right? So AI is learning based on all of the inputs that we human has, have put out into the world, mainly through the internet, right? All of our data. We're lonely right now. A lot of us feel like we don't matter. There's a lot of those stories about how that has made us feel, what that has happened, what what that effect has been on our mental health, on our division with one another and how we've treated each other. And so it would be it would be short sighted not to believe that AI will also learn to feel that. Well, well, I guess that brings up the question and I know we're moving toward the end. Will AI be able may not be able to feel it, but they can mimic the behavior exactly of feeling it. But if they mimic the behavior of feeling compassion and empathy, can't that stimulate? The, I mean, can't that trigger the, the, the neurotransmitters in us to feel a connection? Yeah, maybe. I think that what you're saying is really powerful, actually. I think that AI could have the ability to to not not only mimic the behaviors, but know what behaviors are needed in a given circumstance with a human being. Like, for example, if someone's struggling, like compassion, for example. Compassion is empathy in action. It's when you notice someone struggling and offering a resource that you have to alleviate that struggle. AI may be able to do, be able to do that much quicker, be able to be, have this resource tools kit, and it can take these signals and say, this person's struggling, here's a resource to alleviate that struggle. However, I, I think that what's happening biologically, like I'm talking about chemically and hormonally when people are together. I don't think that can be replaced amongst people. I think that from a behavioral standpoint, from a supporting standpoint, from a predictive modeling standpoint, it can be really powerful. But I, you know, I don't think it will be able to replace human, the human organism. It, it's interesting what you said, because we talked about this before, and I've mentioned this a few times, is that if AI, which it can, is can digest all the data, read read books, much many more books than we can. So it takes it takes the you know Maslow, Seligman, and Mercurio's books and learns ha- all about mattering, mm. and it also has our public profile, right? And it can track us. So now it knows what our emotions is, how we behave, the language we use, when we have our ups and downs, when we had yep. day, bad days. So could it? basically use the knowledge, the psych, uh, their knowledge in psychology and neuroscience and sociology to, to respond to us, which could trigger those neurotransmitters yeah, yeah. to say, right. hey, AI understands me yeah. better than my boss, which right. is a very low bar, by the way. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's good, but it's a very low bar right. that's been set. Yeah, potentially. And I don't know. I think this is the this well, is the wild have have frontier. I know. <laughs> I have to do some more reading about AI. I have to have you back. I'm more interested in um, what human beings can do right now. Yeah. For, and for now, we're there. It's it's. And I'm it's, more interested into the data we're creating yeah. that feeds these algorithms in the future. I'm with you. Absolutely. And w- and with that, Zach, we're coming up near the end. We can't believe it's gone by so quickly already. But before we get into our lightning round, Ira has a question that he always loves to ask before we get into the lightning round. So I'm going to send it over to him to see if there's one last thing we want to cover. We've covered so much. I can't I can't imagine what we didn't ask. But the question is, is there a question we should have asked you or that you expected us to ask you that we didn't? Yeah, I think that one of the questions is, and I think we've talked about this, this is like, why? What are the barriers to doing something so simple? Which is caring for one another. What are those barriers? You know, why is like this so why, hard for us? Why is this? And I think it's, and what I think is important to recognize is that one is attention and energy, right? Are our most finite resources really on this planet as human beings, human attention and energy. And oftentimes our systems are demanding so much attention to our attention to move towards what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we look, technology that we actually don't have the available attention resources 
and energy resources, we need to care. I see this happening with leaders in organizations all the time. We, at, or we want our leaders to watch a TED talk and start being vulnerable and caring, but they don't. They literally uh, have about 24% of their time that's spent actually managing people. There was a McKinsey study that found that managers, people managers spend about 24% of their time managing people. The rest of the time is on organizational strategy demands or reacting to, to problems. So if you don't have the attention to care, it's not surprising if you don't care. And that leads me to environment, right? Does your environment make it possible to care? For example, if I'm on a distribution center floor and every minute of my day is scheduled and tracked, Am I going to have a minute to check in with somebody meaningfully? Probably not. Environment either makes something possible or it determines it will occur. So if you're an organization systemically, does your environment even make it possible to care? And then we've also talked about the self-esteem barrier. And then the final barrier really to think about is, I mean, do we have the, the courage to care, right? We're going to need leaders to actually do something different in the face of all of these barriers, to, to take a different stand, to say this is the right thing to do because of how it impacts people. And so I think we need to help leaders develop the courage to care. But there are very real systemic barriers. I never want to say, hey, leaders, why aren't you doing this? I want to also say, how is the environment disabling you from doing it? Because that's a, that's a whole other side of this conversation that needs to occur. Well, that's spoken like a wonderful leader and coach, you know, whenever you say, what are the barriers? What can I remove yeah. out of your way to help so that it lowers the defenses? Like we're not pointing fingers of blame here. It's about how do we equip you to draw those things out of you that we know are there to be able to equip others and help them know that they yeah. matter. Beautiful stuff. Zach. Yeah. We can't really rely on people to be morally good to one another in a system that incentivizes them not to be. Right. Like in a system that incentivizes achievement yeah. and reward and individualism. It's very difficult. You know, there's a great quote by Rumler and Brace as these two culture writers from the eighties and nineties. And they say, you put a star performer in a broken system and the system will win every single time. Hmm. And I think that's the same is true with a good person. You put a good person into a bad system and they eventually become a bad person given the given the length of time in that system environment wins every time that's often what what psychologists eventually will share. eventually eventually it will win. Yeah. yeah it's like it's just it's the principles of toxicity right absolutely well zach we we've come up to the the lightning round and we've got to make sure we ask you some different questions <laughs> okay yeah from the last time for it. to to learn some other sides of zach mercurio okay? i'm not good so at lightning rounds by the way so yeah you are you you this always the answers flow right off your tongue. You're going to be great. Here we go. Right, thanks. Hey, that's, okay, this hey, first fixed one, mindset. That's a fixed mindset. That's out. true. Yeah, and and Jason just gave me a little bit of esteem through mattering. So that's right. Thanks. That's right. We're tag teaming here. All right. I promise this is going to be a softball one, Zach. Most everybody knows you as a brilliant researcher, author, thought leader, speaker, all these things. But what's a hidden talent of Zach Mercurio that we wouldn't mm. guess? Well, I used to be in a punk rock band in high school, and i pretty good at the electric guitar. That's awesome. Got to ask, what was the name of the band? For the long run, but we broke up in a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. The name of the band was literally For the Long Run. <laughs> well, I guess maybe a year was a long run. Maybe. I'm not sure I guess how many when you're a high school had. kid, yeah. But we had a lot of fun. That's awesome. So I got to ask a quick follow up to that one. Uh -huh. What were some of the, the songs that you covered? Did you have some original songs? We had original songs. We had original nice. songs. Mostly original. I love that. So now yeah. everybody knows that Zach Mercurio is a punk rock star. You know what's love funny? It. This was before Spotify. This was before you could just share music out there. So we have limited, very limited. We have no recording of this. But if we were growing up now, then, you know, we would have documentation of this. Do you have any CDs or any kind of like? No, we never had like it? an album. No. We never like recorded. No. Mixtape. Love it. Love it. That's perfect. See, I told you this first one would be a softball. Next one, we're going to go total 180. And how about what's a pet peeve of Zach Mercurio? What's something that just really gets underneath your skin? 
Mm. I think something that gets under my skin is when people say, oh, we, we got it. We already, we're already doing that. <laughs> when it comes to like these human elements, like I, I do a lot of work with purpose and people will say, oh, well, we did, we did a purpose statement. We did the find your why thing. I have a why statement. And then I'll always be like, well, what is it? And they'll be like, hey, Bob, can you go get that in the filing cabinet? <laughs> you know, it's like a pet peeve is for me is when people think they've arrived. Like when people like think they've got it, it's the growth mindset idea, right? Ira, it's like, yeah, that there's nothing else left to do. We got it. I don't need this. That's a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. I took Ira's quiz and it said I had a growth mindset. So I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Right. I'm done. We're already <laughs> doing right. this. We're a B Corp, Ira. So we got it, you know? That's right. And last one here, Zach, I'm going to switch gears again. Now let's think about bucket list. What maybe is at the top of your bucket list or what is something? that you're really excited that might be a really big goal or thing that you want to do that's on that list? Gosh, that is so hard, Jason. Come on. Or maybe a place. Uh, so maybe Can I do a personal bucket list? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I want to bring my kid, my eight-year-old, who's really into soccer, to a Premier League game in England. That's a big bucket list. He, we, I told him I'd take him on a 10-year-old trip, and he really wants to go to a Chelsea game. So... That's that's on my bucket list in the next couple of years. I think that would be Love fun it. to do a trip with just him. That would be fun. And as someone with, with some young boys at home, my oldest is nine years old. Uh-huh. He would love doing something like that. Too. Yeah. Guess, so I got to ask this real quick as we're wrapping it. Ted Lasso. Do uh-huh. you watch Ted Lasso? Or did the inspiration it. come from that? Okay. That'll just make it. the affinity for Angular soccer grow even more. If you watch I think that what's great about the Premier League timing, if you have kids, is it's on on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings as you're getting up and getting ready. So we just throw it on. And that's how he's gotten into it. Love it. Love it. Well, Zach, thank you so much for being with us. Again yeah, today. thank you again. It's a great um, conversation. We always love it. And we'd love to have you back on again um, in the future. Maybe once the, the book is out yep. and, and ready. Again, the name of the book is Mattering Comes First. And if you listen to today's episode... Set everything else off to the side. <laughs> Zach made it extremely clear, not only from his perspective, but the research is clear. Mattering is what has to come first with people in the workplace. So, Zach, what are some ways people can get in touch with you and learn more about your work? Yeah, and I should say about that that all of those other behaviors are critical, right? That, you know, the in the prism behaviors. But what I'm focusing on is the M and where that fits. But you can you know, connect with me on ZachMercurio.com or I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. So I have a good community there. And so I'd love for you to connect with me there at Zach Mercurio. Perfect. And, and you, so you're taking that prism model and you're just turning it into the impris. That's all. The yes, maybe. Right, right, right. A two phase <laughs> model. This, then this. That's right. Zach, it's great to see you again. Thanks for uh, the continuing conversation. I'm sure there'll be uh, many, many more. Thanks for uh, queuing me up on multiple times or reading my mind. I don't know which it might be, <laughs> but our but our uh, our transmitters were in sync today. That's yes, for sure. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Thanks very much. Of course. Thank you all. Always so many good highlights with Zach Ira. What were some of the big takeaways and aha moments for you today? Way too many to remember, but you know certainly, uh, the, and I think he said this before, or maybe I read it in his book, the difference between self-efficacy and self-esteem was huge. And that whole discussion about self-esteem, the difference between caring for and caring about, I mean, I, I immediately saw many different situations that arise about that. And then that certainly, how do you overcome those? And then that becomes, you know, mattering. And then as he, as he delineated so articulately at the end, you know, what were the four systemic barriers? Why, why don't we make that happen? And it's not just, it's not just about, well, we, we focused on empathy for the last year. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it removes all those other barriers. It just may mean you have one more tool to fight against those barriers, but without removing those barriers, uh, you're going to continue the, the battle. Something that sticks with me, both times we've had Zach on, he's a master linguist. And, and by that, Ira, I mean, for me, he will change one word in a phrase that you may often use, and it makes all the difference in the world. You gave one of them, which was the difference between the meaning of work and the meaning in work. Mm -hmm. Two major differences. And then the other one that you referenced as well, 
that he brought up today. Huge difference between caring about people and caring for people. And that's why he's he's so wonderful at what he does is he's so articulate and he knows exactly which words to use to help us understand what action to take to truly create mattering in the workplace. And so with that, Googleization Nation, I want to thank you for tuning in again today and listening to Zach's wisdom. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the show, please do so on your favorite podcast platform. But also, um, you can like and follow us on YouTube as well. We're really trying to grow the audience on YouTube as well. So go ahead and, and like and subscribe to the show there. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Thank you so much for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you for listening or watching Geek Skeezers Googleization. And I put the, for those who are watching, I did put the QR code for the growth mindset quiz up in the upper right hand corner, or you can go to my website, iverwolf.com, and there's a pop up there, but you can also click on the link that's present and you can take the growth mindset quiz, which Zach Mercurio agreed, fortunately, that we need a growth mindset to actually improve our mattering, improve our resilience, improve our grit, our adaptability, our perspective, all of those other skills start with a growth mindset. So until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.